right, I want you to take your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 11 as we continue in our series on knowing Jesus. Now, if you are just joining us, we are studying a story about a funeral. But this is a story about a funeral with the most unbelievable conclusion. That's why it's appropriate for us to celebrate like we were just celebrating. That's why it's appropriate for us to sing that he is risen and for us to sing at at the top of our lungs and to celebrate as a church that comes alive because we believe that our Savior is alive. We're reading a story with this unbelievable conclusion because it's ultimately an unbelievable conclusion that we ourselves will live. Now, if you'll remember, last week we met three people, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, two sisters and a brother. They had gotten word to Jesus that their brother Lazarus was very ill, but by the time that Jesus had arrived, Lazarus had died. And we said that really the central text of the story was the I am statement in verse 25 where Jesus turns to Martha and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. We're unpacking this story because the claim that Jesus makes in verse 25 is really nothing less than shocking. And we need to understand the details. Why? Well, because we're all facing death. We talked about that last week. In fact, we had a very visual image, and it was a visceral visceral response, wasn't it? We had a casket here when you walked in, and we talked about the reality of death, that we're all facing death. This passage gives us great comfort. It's also very timely. By Tuesday of this week, I had received an email from a woman in our church and her daughter. She was saying that her mother-in-law unexpectedly had passed away and how timely the message was. I had not gotten much further through the week and I had been stopped by someone else who was telling me that they too were walking through a journey where they were in the final days with a relative and they were expecting any moment to receive a phone call. And they were sharing how comforting the words were from John chapter 11. Jesus saying that I am the resurrection. I am the life. Friday morning, very early, all our pastors were gathered for a meeting. And there was a very somber mood when I came in and had learned that on Thursday evening that there had been a tragedy and a young man in our college ministry had gone on to be with the Lord. And that a family in our church were grieving and that there were pastors that were there and ministering with the family. And so this is a timely passage for us. But it's also a passage that comes with questions. And it's questions that we should ask and it's questions that we should answer because death is always among us. We should ask the questions, well, what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the resurrection and the life? I mean, what does he really mean when he says that? We should understand the details. We should understand what he means when he says to believe in him. What does that mean, to believe? We should be asking the question, what does it mean that I live even if I die? I mean, that's very personal to all of us. We would want to understand, well, what's the details behind that particular question? 
Well, we're going to answer those questions, but let me just remind you of the larger context of the passage. This is the last public miracle before the cross. This is the last week of Christ's life. Everything he says, everything that he does is now very strategic. It is just prior to the Passover. He is in Bethany, which is just two miles east of Jerusalem. There is a major road that comes from Jericho. It would have been very busy, filled with people headed towards Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus is about to perform one of the greatest miracles of his ministry. The talk of Bethany would have all been about the resurrection of this man named Lazarus. The talk, of course, would have spilled over into Jerusalem and all throughout the Passover week. Now you're in the scene. Now you're in the moment. Now come back to the text. We're in verse 17. We'd worked through verses 1 through 16 last week. Now we continue verse by verse as we go through the story. And if you remember, we're just kind of working through this like a Bible study. Just verse by verse, unpacking each verse as we read through it. Verse 17 says, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Stop right there. That's really very important as details because it tells us that there's no doubt that Lazarus is dead. This is not a staged miracle. There's no sense that there's a shenanigan going on here. This is authentic. He's been dead four days. By the way, the Jews did not embalm a body. A person went from life to death to the grave. So there was no preparation. He was in the tomb. He was in a cave, we learn. We know that Lazarus had been dead at least for four days and that there was a reaction by Martha, his sister, when Jesus went towards the tomb and said to open it. If you'll look at that very quickly in verse 39, we're going to get to that next week. Jesus says, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be an odor. He'd been in the tomb that long. So we know that this is a man who had been dead for some time. Verse 18 says, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So now we see that a large crowd had gathered for the funeral. Why did they come? They came to, the text says, console them. Paramuthamai in the Greek means to comfort. We see this used twice. It's used also in verse 31. And so there was a crowd that came, and what did they, why did they come? And they came for the same reason we go to funerals, to comfort the family. Now, a typical Jewish funeral is unlike ours that lasts just a few days, maybe a calling hours, and then the funeral itself. No, a typical Jewish funeral would last a minimum of seven days, as many as up to 30 days. Jesus arrives in verse 20 in the middle of it. Verse 20 says, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. So Jesus now is coming from beyond the Jordan, if you'll remember from last week, and he strategically comes late. He now comes in the middle of the funeral, at least in the morning of, of the, those comforters who have come to be with the family, they're mourning the loss of Lazarus. He comes in the middle of that particular period of time. And notice Mary's reaction, middle of verse 20. She remains seated in the house, which is very much like her personality. Martha, though, goes to see Jesus. She goes to confront him. Verse 21 says, she sees him and says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now that sounds almost like a rebuke, doesn't it? I don't necessarily see it that way. Remember, we learned last week that this was a friendship. They were very close. It's likely that Jesus and the disciples spent time with Lazarus and 
Martha and Mary in their home because of the proximity to Jerusalem. I think it's actually better understood as Martha falling into the arms of her Savior in tears and in weeping and saying in lament, if only you would have been here, as if to say, I know you would have healed him. This is less of a rebuke and more, I think, of a reaction to grief. There's still a sense of faith within her response. Notice verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I really don't think she's thinking resurrection here. I don't think she's thinking of the miracle to come. I don't think that's what was in her mind or in her heart because when Jesus goes to open the tomb and begin the process of the resurrection, she's a bit shocked by it. I don't think she has in mind anything in particular. I think she's just making a remark in response to her faith. But notice what Jesus says, and this is why I'm leading you here. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Now Jesus gives her a clue to what's about to happen, but Martha completely misses it. She says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She gets theological with him. She says, I understand that. I understand that we will rise again. She had a good Old Testament understanding of the future. She had a good understanding of Daniel. She had a good understanding of the Psalms. She had a good understanding that the body will rise again. But this is not what Jesus was talking about. Because in verse 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The passage we're speaking about, the I am, the last of the seven I am sayings, I am, I am here, I am he, I am the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me, though he die. Now that would have been a pertinent saying because he's in the midst of death. A man is dead before them, yet shall he live. This is the present reality, he's saying. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He's saying, no, Martha, this is not the future. This is right now. Now, what does he mean? Now we're in the midst of the scene. We're in the midst of the question. Now we have to answer the question. Let's go back to those three questions. What does he mean here when he says, I am the resurrection and the life? Well, notice it's twofold. I am the resurrection and the life. Don't miss that. Let's start in reverse order. First he says, I am the life. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying he alone has the power over life and death. I I immediately think of Revelation chapter 1 that says, I am the first and the last, that great statement of Christ when he says, I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have now the keys I was once dead, I am now alive, I have the keys over death and over Haiti. If we go back into the beginning of John, the book of John chapter 1 verse 4, it says, in him is what? Life. He is the one over all of life. It's what Acts says in Acts 17, in him we live and move and have our being. In him is what? Life. What's that mean? It means all of life is held in Him. All authority over life is now held in Christ. It's it's the theology of Colossians. All of life is of Christ. He holds the power of life. That's what He's saying. I am life. I am your life. I hold authority over all life. It's a great word of comfort in the midst of what? In the midst of a funeral, in the midst of death. 
What seems to be absence in the midst of a funeral? Life. Jesus is saying, I am life. Life is not absent when I am present. Do you hear that? And then he says, I am the resurrection. What does he mean by that? Well, he says, in essence, I've been there. I myself will be raised from the dead. He himself is the resurrection and is alive. Now, in just one short week, he will demonstrate that bodily himself. He will become the first fruits of the resurrection. First Corinthians says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have, been, who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, who's that? That's Adam. By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the first fruits. What's that mean? That means because he has risen from the dead, we then go to 2 Corinthians. He who raised Jesus will what? Will also raise us. That's the promise. He leads the way. He has complete authority, get this, over life. He has complete authority over death, and he has demonstrated that. Now hold that in your mind for a moment. Several weeks ago, I met a man who came to me after a service, and he had a cell phone in his hand, and he said, I have a piece of art that I want to show you. And I never met him before, at least I don't recall meeting him before. And he had this piece of art on his phone. And he said, I drew this. And I was fascinated by it because we were in the middle of the I am study. And I knew we had quite a few I am statements left to unpack, and I knew we were coming to the last. And I, for some reason, latched hold of this particular drawing. It's done with pencil, color pencil. And I said, I, I want to meet and I want to talk about this. And I, wa- I, I want to hear the story behind this. And we did, and it was fascinating. And I, I, I'd like you to hear just a bit of it, and then we're going to talk a little bit more. Watch this video. My name is Steve Lippett. I've been in Akron since 1992 with my wonderful wife, Joellen, raising two boys, Corey and Scott, uh, practice orthopedic surgery over that time. Uh, My story with art has been interesting. Uh, Early on, I enjoyed, I guess, paint by numbers and doodling and drawing, and my parents always encouraged me. And then when I got into orthopedic surgery, part of my career direction was in teaching of orthopedic resonance, and that lended itself to medical illustrations. And uh, I still felt unfulfilled, though, with kind of the personal expression or how art as the God-given talent was coming out in Christianity. I found myself doodling one Easter, the empty tomb, And as I looked at it, there was a stirring, I think, in my heart and and God kind of calling me with his relationship and the talent he gave to to do more of that. So it really became an important part of my life and a way of worship. So as I started to develop a method of art, my drawings were always based on a Bible verse. Is since the art is inspired by a verse, the verse always remains with the art so that anyone that would view it, the Holy Spirit could work through the verse rather than the art itself. So in my most recent piece that was titled Authority was based on the verse John 19, 10, 11. Jesus is standing before Pilate after returning from the guards after being scourged. Pilate says to Jesus, will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you or to crucify you? 
And Jesus replied, you would have no authority over me unless it was given from above. And I think the reason that this verse spoke to me was just this irony of Pilate with his worldly power trying to explain, I mean, to the Son of God, he's God, trying to tell him, don't you know I have authority? It has the signet ring that would be the seal of official Caesar power for sealing documents. It had the scepter of his being governor and the idol of the eagle, which is a military symbol in the times of Rome. And then his Roman armor and the symbol that he's of a military might. So the next part of the drawing was the contrast of Jesus and his authority. God in the Old Testament revealed himself as the I Am, and Jesus in the New Testament Gospel actually had said, I Am. And I said, oh, that's it. I'll put the letters I Am on the wounds of his back and do it subtly where someone will need to study the drawing and to read the verse and to be taken in by the scene and then to see that the worldly power of Pilate is actually confronting the I Am. I called it finished, and it didn't rest, and it didn't feel good, and it actually was uneasy. So in feeling this conflict with the art, um, prayer with my wife Joellen, prayer with others, middle of the night, it kind of sits back on my mind at two in the morning, and looked at it and immediately saw that one additional lash to Jesus' back, one additional stroke of the pencil, and the random marks that God had helped me place there would spell the word lamb. And the whole meaning and the verse came to life because God worked through me to get it the way he wanted. My hope for the congregation is that they might be as touched by getting into this scene of where Jesus indeed is in front of Pilate, how he's allowed himself to suffer in the way that he did, giving up the authority, so to speak, of God, emptying himself to be like man and do his Father's will to pay the debt for our sins. And I hope that is an example also to the congregation that you would look into your own hearts and your own God-given talents for ways to share in the relationship with giving it to God and even be surprised by how he uses it for the sake of his kingdom, his glory, and even for others to think deeper about matters of Christ. Well, you know by now how much I love it when you all use your gifts and abilities that the Lord has given you to glorify him and to bless us. And so when Steve came and he shared his art, I immediately was drawn to it. And I loved the reality of John 19 and Jesus standing before Pilate and the, the call of authority. You know, Pilate is here and he says, do you not know that I have authority to release you? or the authority to crucify you, and then Jesus answers him, you have no authority over me at all unless it's given to you from above. You realize that this is just a moment that authority is the issue, but the reality is authority is always the issue. It's the issue over life and death. He has the authority over all of life, over all of death. And this is just a momentary scene where one man has a misunderstanding of his authority, but yet many times we have a misunderstanding of the much broader authority that death has over us. And we need to see it in the reality that Jesus Christ has the authority over our entire life, including our death. And when we understand that, he has that type of authority, we then can bring John 11:25 into it and realize that this is a reality in our life. That when we believe in Jesus Christ, have faith in Him, that He leads the way 
over death into eternal life. John eleven twenty five 25 has been on my mind all week. And it's been the impact of this moving through one conversation after another. It started on that Tuesday when I received that email. That woman in our congregation who was telling me about her daughter losing her mother-in-law. And I was thinking John eleven twenty-five. And not long after that, I met a gentleman who attends here regularly who has some physical disabilities. And I was thinking John eleven twenty-five. And I was thinking that at the resurrection, his disabilities, presently his body wasting away, would be renewed. Later that week, I was in a conversation with a woman who volunteers here at the church, and later that night, that evening when we were talking, most of the people had left, and we were just sitting, and she shared with just a few of us that she had received a devastating diagnosis, that she had received news from her doctor that she had the early stages of Alzheimer's. And she said through tears that her greatest concern that she would soon forget the faces of her children. And John eleven twenty five 25 came to my mind, and I was thinking there would be a time where she would be renewed. Her memory would be made whole. John eleven twenty five 25 came to my mind Friday morning when I heard of the tragic events of this young college student who had gone on to be with the Lord, who had served at Camp Carl, and many of our college students knew and was involved in campus focus. And you see, it's a promise. That's what this is. It's the last great promise of a Savior on his way to the cross to you. And he says it's a promise to all those who believe. So we have to ask the question, all right, well, what does it mean to believe? Well, the word believe in the Greek is the word pistuo, which means to have faith, to trust. But then we have to ask, well, all right, well, what's the object of the faith? Well, the object is Jesus, right? We place our trust in a person. This is not some empty religion. It's not some empty faith. It's not some empty theology. It's personal. It's Jesus standing before Martha. It's Jesus speaking of a relationship that he had with Lazarus. I mean, think about it just in general terms. When you're sick, you don't go to a medical book. You go to a doctor. I mean, we can carry this on out. When, when you're being sued, you don't go to a law book. You go to a lawyer, right? You can just keep playing this out. We're not going to a theological book. We're going to a person. We're going to a Savior. I remember when I was a college student and going to visit my grandparents who lived in Stone Mountain, Georgia. I was on my way for a weekend, or rather a week getaway to Florida, and we were driving to Florida for spring break, and we stopped to see my grandparents, and I see my elderly grandfather. And he used to work in the military, in the airline industry, and he was always this tall, strapping, my grandmother used to speak of him in terms of dashing. And now he's a frail man attached to oxygen, sitting three feet away from the television. And 
He'd been a believer as long as I had known him, so all of my life. He's in the last stages now of his life, and he's housebound, and all that he was watching were tele-evangelists, those who would teach on television. And, and I was there with him, and a man would come and would share the gospel on television, and his eyes would well up, and the man would make an offer to receive Christ, and my grandfather would bow his head and re- ask to receive Christ, and my, my grandmother said he does that dozens of times during the day. He's frightened that, that he somehow lost his salvation. That is not unreal in the lives of people who have spent years following Jesus. Death is close. The mind becomes feeble and frail. Jesus says, if you believe the promise of resurrection, He says, you will live. Do you believe? Write it down. If necessary, put a date on it so that when the mind is frail, you refer back to it. I believe in Jesus Christ. He has saved me from my sins. He says, that even if you die, you will live. What does that mean? Well, that's part of our questioning, right? What does it mean I live even if I die? Well, let's break this down so that we know what does this mean. There are two concepts in verses 25 and 26. They sound redundant. They actually teach separate truths. The first concept, he is speaking physically of a future resurrection. He says, whoever, look at the text, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He's speaking physically. You, in a future resurrection, shall have a resurrected body. Let me have you turn back to John chapter 5 to see this. John 5, Jesus is teaching again. Ironically, he's teaching on the authority of the Son. The Father has given the Son authority. He says in verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Do you you understand all will rise again? There will be a resurrection of the righteous and a resurrection of the unrighteous. Let me show you the resurrection, what often is referred to as the first resurrection of the righteous. It's found in 1 Thessalonians. You're going to want to look this up because this applies to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. And I want you to pay it. We're going to start in verse 13, but I want you to pay close attention to verse 18, why the Apostle Paul puts this in the text. We'll start in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, about those who are asleep, that's a word for death, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, there it is, the first resurrection, the first fruits of the resurrection, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now stop for a moment. Do you know anyone 
who has died as a follower of Christ. They now are in this category. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, now this is you. If you are hearing the sound of my voice, you are most likely alive. You are in this category. You will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from the heavens with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is often referred to as the first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous. This is speaking of the rapture. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Death has always been a concern. And so what does Paul say? Encourage one another. Jesus Christ, the first fruit of the resurrection, the I am, the resurrection and the life, has said, I have conquered death. Those who have died who are asleep in the Lord will rise again at his coming. We who are alive will be caught up. The resurrected bodies will be joined with him. You say, but yet there's a second concept here. The second concept, remember now he's speaking physically, moves to the concept of spiritually. Turn back to John chapter 11, just so you see it. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Second concept, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. What is he speaking of here? He is speaking here spiritually. He is speaking of life now. You believe now, you believe now in Jesus Christ. What does it mean to believe? It means to put your faith and trust in a person in Jesus Christ. It means you have eternal life. John 6, 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Eternal life is spoken of 43 times in the New Testament alone. After he says this, notice in end of verse 26, he turns to Martha and he says, do you believe this? He makes it personal. Do you? Do you believe this? You see, if you can say yes, then you have eternal life. If you say yes, then even if you die, you shall live. You will have a resurrected body. That even if you die, you will be absent from the body for a period of time, and you'll go immediately to be with the Lord. There will be a time when you will receive a new resurrected body. Martha responds with an amazing, almost creedal, three-part confession. Notice it in verse 27. She says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into this world. Notice this. I believe you are the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. That's where we start. We believe who Jesus says that he is. Then second, I believe you are the Son of God. That's affirming his deity. And then thirdly, she says, I believe you are the one coming into the world. I believe you are the promised one, the one we've waited for, the one we've expected, the one the Old Testament has said, you are the seed of Abraham, Genesis 22. You are the prophet of God before Moses, Deuteronomy 18. You are the suffering servant, Isaiah 53. You are the crucified and 
resurrected one, Psalm 16, you are the son of David, 2 Samuel 7. You see, this is the present reality. This is your present reality. But look at the text. Can you say like Martha, yes, Lord, I believe. What a wonderful text. John eleven twenty five ought to resonate in your mind and ring true in your heart whenever death becomes present in and around your life. It's momentary, beloved. We have a greater hope a resurrected hope. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? In the presence of your friends and your family and witnesses around you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, Can you say, like Martha, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, Lord. Oh, God, our great Father, who is our shepherd and our guide, our good Father, thank you for Jesus Christ, the risen one. We have sang about him. We have celebrated him. We have taught about him. Now we long to see him face to face. For those who have gone before us, we mourn, but we do not mourn as those who have no hope. We are people of great hope, knowing that they... Our loved ones see you face to face. That the reality of John 11, 25, minds are clear, bodies are healed. Sadness is over. Depression is gone. Loneliness is over. The joy of their salvation is complete. We long for that day knowing that the joy of our salvation is found in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And we long for our day when we too shall see you, Lord Jesus, face to face. Thank you that you are the one, the conquering one, authority over life and death the risen one, and we too say with Martha, I believe, yes, Lord. May this be a day of great joy, comfort, and celebration for your people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a message from The Chapel in Akron, Ohio. For more information about The Chapel or to listen to more of these types of life-applicable messages, please go to our website at thechapel.life.